Christmas. That special time of year where you pretend that you don't want to fight half your family. A time where you contemplate, should I spend more money on something they may not like? And a time where everyone feels like they need to talk about the most controversial thing. Yes, Die Hard is a Christmas movie. Suck me stupid if you don't agree. Why am I starting off the video like this, you may ask? <laughs> well, Christmas movies are a dime a dozen this time of year, but a good Christmas horror movie, about one in a million. But one that people love to bring up is Krampus. For those that don't know who or what Krampus even is, allow me to explain asterisk the best I can. According to History.com, Krampus is a folklore from Austria's Alpine region that dates centuries back in order to scare kids to behaving around Christmas time. One National Geographic says that Krampus is a centuries old Christmas tradition in Germany. And then I went to Wikipedia and essentially it started in the 6th century but wasn't actually documented until the 16th or 17th century. So he's been around for a while. Will Krampus go on the nice list with the likes of Killer Clowns from Outer Space and Halloween Ends, or will it join the naughty list with Attack of the Killer Tomatoes, Rubber, and even the Resident Evil series on Netflix? Ugh. Oh god. We start this movie off with a nice little introduction into what Black Friday looks like every fucking year in the US. Yeah, this is about what Black Friday looks like. Fun story, I actually worked my first ever Black Friday when I worked at Walmart, and oh my god, it's fucking crazy. Like, I literally was just walking around the store just making sure people were okay, and then my manager looks at me and is like, oh hey, by the way, there's blood in front of you. I look down and there's just a little small pool of blood. We don't know from who and we didn't know from where. Y'all motherfuckers are crazy during this time of year. Now we see the Engel family enter the house with their son who just got done having this other kid sample what all 10 of his knuckles taste like. He feels really bad about the fight because he didn't want to ruin Christmas for the little kids and understandably so. But when he goes to ask his dad if they're going to watch Charlie Brown and make hot chocolate and stuff. The father basically says, nah, fuck you, you do it yourself, you caused a fight, and then just walks off. What? Omi sits with Max as Max is asking her if she still believes in Santa, and while she is trying to give him an answer, she spaces out as if something disturbing is lurking behind that story. And this is what we like to call foreshadowing. Cue the holiday tradition and bring in the kids and other family members that you wouldn't mind trapping inside of a burning house. The look on these people's faces, including this pudgy little shit, just, it makes them look like they've just lost control of their life and they're just hanging on by a thread. It's dinner time and the first thing that upset me right off rip, like more upset than a bull getting a schmeat and tater zapped, is that he is given kudos to being a disgusting piece of shit towards Beth, Max's sister. Uh. <laughs> That's my boy! On top of all of this, Howard, the uncle of Max, starts patronizing Tom, the father of Max, about his training as an Eagle Scout, while Howard's kids, Stevie and Jordan, are sitting there fucking bullying Max, and Beth is trying to stop Max from starting shit! It isn't his fault! They start reading Max's letter to Santa and start making fun of him for it, which prompts him to open a big old can of whoop ass and steal the note back from them. And then he finishes it off with basically saying, fuck you, fuck Christmas, I'm gone. It's safe to say that this family could easily print money for Dr. Phil if he ever chooses to have them on. Tom enters Max's room and says, hey, you know, being part of a family means you have to deal with the asshats that come along with it and gives him encouragement to ship off his letter to Santa. And he's so filled with holiday joy that he decides to put the letter back in the envelope and gets ready to ship it out. Oh, well, never mind. It's now December 23rd, and there's a huge ass blizzard outside with a creepy ass snowman looking in the house. Beth goes to her parents with such horrible news. She hasn't heard from her boyfriend after nine consecutive text messages and she decides now is the best time to leave in the middle of a damn blizzard taking the shoelace express to his house to find him and make sure he's okay and with these gold medal parents over here they're like yeah you know yeah that, that's fine but you get an hour though you have to be back in an hour or you're gonna be in big trouble missy <laughs> on the way there she hears jingle bells and everything starts getting dark she looks and well it's not a flash mob of carolers it's this fucking Elden Ring boss chilling on someone's house. 
and he's not happy that you're there. She tries to get into a delivery van, but notices that the driver is bricked, I mean frozen, so this prompts her to hide underneath the van. And when all things are good, they never truly are, because after Krampus leaves, there's a jack-in-the-box that just plays music and, well, I, I don't think I need to tell you what's gonna happen next, do I? The family is still sitting in the dark and the mother is even more anxious. I mean, hell, even Max is starting to get concerned. So this prompts Tom and Howard to suit up to go out there and find Beth. But Omi says, hey, don't do that. It's too dangerous. You should stay here. Tom says, okay, ma, I understand. I won't be a dumb bastard today. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, no, th this just motivates him to go outside anyways. They're driving through the blizzard when they see a yellow spinning light in the distance. Well, what do you know? It's a snowplow. That could be useful, but there's something not right about it. Uh, there's presents in the passenger seat. There's keys in the ignition. Oh, yeah. And there's a hole in the window showing that whatever was in the vehicle is now alive in the past tense. Good thing Howard decided to equip his Walking Dead loadout because he hands Tom a 44 Magnum while he's sitting there carrying that good old pump action. They begin to clear the house and stumble into the kitchen. Gingy from Shrek is pinned to the fridge with a knife in his chest and they see giant hoof prints on the floor. But Howard's convinced that a gas lamp blew in the house or something. They hear screaming outside, so they decide, hey, let's chase it. Could be fun. And this almost causes Howard to get taken away by some damn snow snake. But Tom scared it away, so good job. The family hears the gunshots, but then sees these two dumbasses trickle into the house, and they're trying to de-escalate the situation. One of the kids asks about his injury and how it happened, and Howard says that it might be a bear trap. Like, that's a common thing that happens. Howard tells Tom to go to sleep because a shepherd's gotta watch his flock or something like that. So, Howard can keep watch if anything happens. Now, I'm gonna pause real quick. The main goal that Omi told these people was to keep the fire hot. Okay? Just keep that in mind. Now, let's continue. Oh, son of a bitch! Howard! What the fuck? Well, because of this cock muppet over here, Augustus Gloop gets wakened out of a dead sleep because of a gingerbread cookie, which eventually leads to him being taken away by Krampus. Omi keeps it 100 and blames everyone for what's happening. Especially Howard! Howard blames himself, and rightfully so. This is also the time that we hear Omi's childhood story of Christmas, and because she wanted to wish her parents away, Krampus came to town and got shit done. All that was left was a single jingle bell that said Gruß vom Krampus or greetings from Krampus at the fireplace after all was said and done. I will say the animation in this storytelling was top notch. I was so impressed by it. Howard doesn't believe a single thing that Omi just said and he decides that he's going to go out there and try to find Howie Jr. himself. Yes, that's the curly haired kid's name, Howie Jr. Great name, Dad. When Tom tries to intervene and stop him, Howard reminds him who has the talking stick and points the shotgun at him. And when he opens the door, not only are there a shit ton more snowmen, but they brought some friends as well. This next part of the movie and how it's constructed is a cluster and really confusing at times to pay attention to if I'm trying to describe it. So I'll do it the best that I can, and if I leave out details, I'm sorry. Tom, Sarah, and Linda, the sister of Sarah, decide to go up to the attic after Howard's kids start screaming. Howard's told to stay in the kitchen and honestly, fine, cool, whatever. Tom, Sarah, and Linda notice this weird predator looking Jabba the Hutt bodied clown thing, but that's not all they gotta worry about. Above them is some freaky demon angel doll thing and a crackhead version of Fender Pinwheeler from Robots. Also, Freddy Fazbear makes an appearance. They're getting their shit pushed in by these toys before Linda decides to go sicko mode and clear house. Back to Howard, he is casing the kitchen while the gingerbread are sitting there and playing mind games with him. Well, this quickly turns into squid games when they start full auto firing a nail gun into his leg. These dumbasses have stormtrooper aim and manage to miss every shot after that, including whenever he's holding up a cutting board, they don't bother to shoot him anywhere else just besides the cutting board. <laughs> they start charging at him and that's when Howard depends on his trusty shotgun to get him out of trouble. Man. 
<laughs> that face, that face right before is priceless. Right before all hope seems lost and Howard is going to be the only person killed by a cookie, uh, the dog eats it. Mm, kind of cheesy if you ask me. When they all regroup in the living room, they start hearing a bunch of screaming and banging above them in the attic or the roof. So they let Rosie, the dog, play a little bit of Among Us and drag these fuckers through the roof into the living room. The elves break in and go on demon time because they take two things, the family hostage and the baby. Well, three if you count Howard, but he kind of went on his own free will. So good, I'm glad he's gone. After the elves leave at the sound of a horn or something, they all decide now is the best time to leave. Omi's still trying to reignite the fire in the furnace but they're just worried about getting out of there. Just as they're about to start leaving, Omi stays behind, as if she can fight this 1400 year old mall Santa with scoliosis on her own. We finally get the best look of Krampus we can get this whole entire movie, and my God, he looks ugly. That is a face not even his own damn mother loved. I mean, my God. Krampus tries to do some inappropriate stuff and then presents a bag of killer toys. Obviously. They push through the blizzard to get to the snowplow, and that's when the snow snake that almost got Howard racks up a triple kill with Tom, Sarah, and Linda all going. The elves then surround the snowplow, probably because they think it's their Uber, and they snatch Stevie out of it. Max hops out, but Krampus hot drops right in front of him, but he's got a gift. It's the letter from Santa with a Krampus jingle bell attached to it. We fade to black temporarily just to see Max chugging through the snow still. He starts to hear screaming, and who could it be? It's Stevie. Why? Because she's with Krampus and his gang of fucked up childhood drawings come to life. He yells out like, hey assholes, and throws the jingle bell in their general direction. However, he apologizes for the wishes that he made earlier in the movie that kind of consist of the same thing that Omi wished for her parents. It's weird because I, I think there's a language barrier somewhere because what they hear is open up a pit to hell in the middle of the ground and drag Stevie to it. Max offers himself as a sacrifice and just for a second, Krampus looks like he's having a change of heart. Like he's about to reverse his decision. <laughs> Never mind. Max gets suspended over the hole, he apologizes, and Krampus, feeling all these kind words and sincerity in his heart, he basically says, psych, fuck you and your cousin, and drops Max into the pit of hell. The next morning, Max screams and falls out of bed. It's December 25th, Christmas day. He heads downstairs and sees the whole family, including Beth, opening their gifts and having a grand old time. Everything is all good until Max opens up his gift and it is the same Krampus jingle bell that he had gotten. The look of devastation, trauma, I don't know, just some look of agony overtakes the family as the camera pans out to see that they are in a snow globe amongst other snow globes, presumably of other families that Krampus has destroyed. And that's when the movie ends. Now, I've heard about this movie when it first came out in 2015, and at the time I thought it was cool, especially since a couple years before that, I found out about Krampus from one of my friends who was a German foreign exchange student at the time. And you know, I didn't really give it a thought about seeing it until now, but I could have been just fine without seeing it. By definition, it is a horror movie, but from what I've seen, it's just some demon cosplaying as Santa Claus. Nothing too spooky. Now with all things considered, I'm gonna go ahead and put this in the not too shabby tier and I'm gonna keep it there unless I change my mind, which I probably won't. Let me know down below what you thought about the movie and while you're at it, go ahead and subscribe to the channel, tap the bell to all and like the video so you never miss when I post the next one. Next week, we're gonna be covering another Christmas horror movie that I hope all of you are gonna really enjoy. Until then, keep it brutal, keep each other safe. Until next time, later.